Mein Name ist Walter Josef Fink und ich bin geboren in Graz, Austria. Und wir sind nach Linz gefahren, wo ich immer gewohnt habe, bis ich nach Kanada gekommen bin. Das war ja sehr herrlich und eine sehr schöne Landschaft. Danke, danke. Ein Prost zu dir. <lacht> As Burlington uh, changed, both uh, Joe, to some degree, and his business uh, hasn't changed. He still caters to the people that wanted more traditional haircuts, and over the years, with all the changes in that, Joe accepted some, but uh, to others, uh, he shied away from it, and uh, uh, stuck to more of the basics, and uh, still does today. Well, like you can go to Joe and go in there and maybe your wife tells you you should get such and such a haircut or, your, or the father tells the kid to get such and such a haircut, but when you go to Joe, you always get the haircut what Joe wants. It simplifies matters. The new breed, they come in, they don't know how to do flat tops, what they call it now. We used to call it brush cuts, flat tops, because they don't learn it and it's a shame. My wife always dreaded when he came over to help me trim hedges because uh, she said that our hedges always ended up like they had a brush cut and that they probably weren't going to be the same for the rest of the summer. <laughs> but at least that way we didn't have to trim them as frequently. Joe has been around Burlington for a long time. In fact, he seems like a permanent fixture. He's. Uh, has so many people that he knows that have been in and out of this barbershop, in fact, going to three generations. Joe is an institution, all right. I don't think there's anybody around that doesn't know him. Joe Fink, he's the sexiest man in town. Oh, well, I was born uh, in uh, Austria, in Graz. And after I was a year old, we, my dad moved to Linz. He had a, got into a bake shop, he was a baker. And uh, I went to school in Linz, uh, public school and high school. And I started learning the trade as barber. We had an air raid and I came home every day at noon. And I ran home every day while the bombs were falling. It was kind of scary start mentioning some names. And I says, well, God, that's our house. And there was nothing left. And everybody was killed. My mother and 13, there was 14 people killed totally. But my mother was killed, but we never found anything of anybody. So nobody could get a burial or nothing. There was just nothing left. After the war, I worked for the Americans and worked as a barber there, and uh, that's where I cut uh, Big Fella's hair. And uh, his name was Eisenhower, I think. General Eisenhower. And we had a great party with him. 
And then I, in 1951, I decided to come to Canada, and I did. His best friend was going with a friend of mine, and they would come to the theater all the time. And I could tell he liked me, but uh, I wasn't interested. But at that time, I had another boyfriend. And she didn't have nothing to do with me, period. <laughs> she hated me. She said, what a jerk. I don't like him, you know? <laughs> I said, this is all going to be you someday. She said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know. We went to get our marriage license, and in them days, they only charged you five dollars for a marriage license. And we had ten dollars, and we paid the five dollars for the marriage license. The other five dollars was going to be for the minister to marry us. And when we came out of City Hall, there was a five-dollar parking ticket on our car, so we had to wait till that following payday before we could get married. <laughs> I told I'm going to marry you, and I've been married for 41 years now. I wasn't born a fink, I just married one. Joe had started off with virtually nothing when he came to Canada. Joe, I think, uh, with the little bit that he had, he put everything to the best use. He's been always very shrewd as far as his money. He uh, wanted to make a better life for himself, for his wife, for his family. When he does something, like he goes into it full speed, but he still watches the money, he seems to have a knack to just step into things at the right time. Everything is to make a deal. When you're not cutting hair, he's selling cars, buying cars, selling apartments, houses, this house here, I bought off of Joe. Somewhere in the summer of 86, I went to, came over to see him. I said, Joe, I don't think I'll buy your house. Joe, well, he says, well, I can see a deal going through his fingers, you see, so. <laughs> Joe goes to the cupboard and he brings out his uh, best line of defense, one bottle of brandy. When we get towards the bottom end of the of <laughs> this bottle of brandy, the place looked an awful lot better. Oh, when I started on the ski club, and I became a manager of the club, so naturally you put on hours. When Joe was involved with the ski club, how he kept going uh, was beyond me, because uh, he would work at the uh, barber shop all day, and when they were, they'd go up to the ski club, they'd be skiing at night, and then when they were making snow, if they ran into a problem, he would either stay, or sometimes he'd just get to home, get to sleep, somebody would phone him, he'd be back up there all night making snow, and in some cases, he ended up coming strictly from the ski hill to the barber shop and cut hair all day. He's got a lot of stamina, he keeps going. If he was making things, he'd make a fortune. If he'd make haircuts, he'd probably made half a fortune. That's the story of my life, eh? Work, work, work.
two years ago, I took my son over, Christopher, and showed him up. He'd never been there. He was uh, 29 years old that year. Showed him Venice, then we went back to the into Innsbruck. He loved Innsbruck. I was just, he think that was the greatest place in the world he ever seen. And then we went back to Canada again after two weeks. And uh, a month later, he got killed in an accident by a train behind Ikea here. You just don't get over it. You know, they're supposed to bury you, not you're supposed to bury them. Uh, that's two years ago. You, just, you never get over it, do you? Ah, boy. You gotta do what the guys want. If you want it short, you want it long, you want to shave, we'll shave. Nobody else shaves in town. Now, the one thing about Joe, uh, which has never changed over the years, uh, Joe would do anything to help uh, anybody. If you're ever in trouble, needed help financially, no matter what, needed help to do something physical, ask Joe, and he would always be there to help you. He's very good, like, looking after people, huh? Like some of his customers, what he has had for years, he'll many times, like in the evening, he'll go to the house and give him a haircut. And he also goes down to the hospital. He gets his rewards in seeing what he has done for others. Joe's definitely assist the underdog. He's, I know a lot of people he's helped sometimes. You know, the more you do, the less you get. I know a lot of cases he's never even collected a thank you. But it doesn't deter him. He, he keeps doing it. He's a good natured so. But you know, I know when I was didn't have anything, I didn't have anywhere to go, and I always feel, you know, you feel sort of, I know it's tough for some people. I haven't learned yet. Someday I will. I don't know when, but someday. Joe Fink? What could I say? He's got to be the best. My dad's very active. He, he likes the cottage now. He, he'll take off up there just for the day, you know. Um, summertime seems to be the most fun up there for all of us. We get to swim in and fish in and have a couple beers, you know, and catch a couple fish. And... You 
Yeah, like when the time comes that uh, that Joe retires, uh, I think Burlington will lose part of uh, almost like of history, yeah? But I know a lot of people, a lot of people know me. I guess uh, I've worked with the town. And most of the old guys, though, they're all gone. There's hardly anybody left. Only me. The art is gone. 